All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Doug Shoemaker. It's July 8th, 2024. We're at Shoemaker Vineyards in North Plains. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, my pleasure. Uh, first question to get things rolling is why wine? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate question, right? Um, uh, for me, you know, it's been, it was sort of a, a gradual, um, uh, you know, sort of introduction and, and process of getting there. So I grew up on a farm, um, a hobby farm um, outside of Banks, so here in Washington County. And uh, having grown up here in Oregon and Washington County, was sort of exposed to the wine industry from, you know, really a young age. In fact, my earliest memory of that was, I mean, talking again, like you were saying about the, you know, the, the founding folks that uh, came up here um, and started the wine industry in Oregon. So my parents lived out in Shoals at the time. And so I was probably, you know, five or six years old or something like that. And they got invited to um, what I described as like a, a, a hippie wine party at the Ponzi's. And apparently I've heard more recently that they used to, they like, they still throw this party sometimes, but that was what they did. And this must have been like 1973, you know? So this was 50, around 50 years ago. Um, and I still have like memories of like, like this is pretty cool just as a kid, like hanging out and everybody's just, it's a day like today and, and summer and great. and. Uh, my parents both, you know, um, were wine consumers and enjoyed wine, and that was has always been kind of their, you know, their go-to beverage was wine. So, again, from a young age, introduced to to that, um, and then having grown up on a farm, that's where I kind of developed my agricultural background, and so just. Um, we didn't have a vineyard, we didn't have a winery, but my parents had a hobby farm just outside of Banks. Um, 40 acres, raised mostly sheep, um, but had some uh, uh, grain products and things too. They would lease out some of the land. Um, so growing up on a farm, I really uh, developed, you know, a, an appreciation for the land, you know, and how important it is that we do good things with the land that we have and take care of it. and and preserve it and you know the the buzzword that i always love was being a good steward you know a good steward of the land so um i think that in, that particular word encapsulates a lot of what i think farming does and what what you know the wine industry wants to do with this beautiful land that we're a part of here so um that you know certainly was in my background and so then uh you know i had to pick a career um, I was always really good at science, so I decided to um, go that route and, and chose a career in medicine. Um, so I was a physician for 30 years and just retired at the beginning of this year. Um, but along that journey, even though I you know, made a career out of medicine, I always had this interest in wine. You know? And then obviously when I um, reach an age where I can start consuming in, uh, wine, where I can start appreciating it, um, then my sort of desire to be a part of the wine industry just continued to grow. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, wine is just, um, I was reminded of this quote recently and it just, it, it brought back a lot of what it means to me and it's Robert Louis Stevenson's quote of, you know, wine is bottled poetry. Mm -hmm. So to me, and I, you know, when I introduce folks to our wine, you know, a bottle of wine is just like a story in a bottle. You know, there's just so much complexity to it. You know, it's so much more than just a beverage. Um, you know, from the story behind where the wine comes from, to the land, to all these things. So it's, to me, it appealed to my artistic side, which I always had. I just, you know, had sort of both sides of my brain, you know, always, always there, the artistic side as well as, you know, the the scientific side of my brain. And so I always tried to cultivate that, you know, that other cultural artistic side of my brain too. And so through, you know, reading and literature and, and um, stories and all of that. And so that's why wine continued to be a part of my life beyond just enjoying it at, at a dinner. You know, um, it, I, Whenever I would either buy wine or consume wine, I was always super interested in like the story behind it. You know, to me, that's just so critical. Um, 
in really appreciating what wine is all about. So, um, with that in mind, uh, in 2001, my wife and I started looking, Melissa and I started looking for some land. Um, she also grew up on a farm in Washington County. Her dad was a pig farmer, um, you know, and that was actually his career. My parents, it was kind of a hobby thing that they did, but uh, Melissa's dad, my father-in-law, made a career out of, of raising pigs. So small farm um, in Washington County, you know, 800 pigs sounds like a lot, but it's small, you know, with comparison to a lot of things. So, you know, she and I both had that, that love of the land and, and rural living and all of that. So when I finished medical school in Portland and decided, you know, was looking for where we wanted to live and raise a family and all of that, uh, we found this place uh, and, and bought it in 2001. At the time, it was just a field of weeds, I tell people. So it really hadn't had anything done with it, you know, in, in years. I think the house uh, originally that we've remodeled now, but the house originally built in 72. Um, but surrounding it was just this field of weeds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I bought a tractor and that was my first step. And I, all I did then was just, you know, mow the weeds. Um, and we had three young kids. So we kind of put other, um, other goals on hold for a little while. Uh, but always with the, the goal, with the vision of planting grapes here. Um, and I was pretty sure we'd be able to do it because across the street from us, there's a vineyard um, that's been there quite a while. And, you know, they were producing wine and, and, and selling the grapes to um, uh, another winemaker. I can't remember who it is now. But um, so I was pretty confident that, you know, it would be able to, to produce good wine and good grapes. So we sort of sat on that, that vision for a while. Um, and in 2012, I took a sabbatical from my job. So I took three months off uh, to sort of explore that opportunity. Like, could, could we do this? How can we make this work? Um, and actually hired um, a former patient of mine who um, was a vineyard development guy. He owned, he owned a vineyard development company and had been, you know, worked with a lot of the big names over the years and helping to develop it. So I hired him. He came out and did, you know, this whole um, analysis, you know, of the soil, of the topography, uh, you know, put together a plan, including, you know, spreadsheet costs, all that kind of thing. And so in 2014, we pulled the trigger and planted the grapes. So that's kind of my story with regards to, you know, why wine and leading up to making that final decision to do it. Okay, we'll come back to that, but let's talk about other career first. So tell yeah. us about tell us about the medical career. What you mentioned science, yeah. why why the medical career path? Yeah, so um, I think a, a couple of reasons. Obviously, you know, in order to go to medical school, you have to be you know good at science. You know, I mean, you you can't do it without <laughs> without being able to you know do well at those uh, you know in chemistry and biology and all of that. So um, using the you know God-given gifts that I had, um, you know, I uh, felt like that was really the way I needed to go. Um, I have two extremely important women in my upbringing, my grandmother and my mom, um, both of whom, you know, just really instilled in me the importance of giving back to others. You know, it was, that was always super important, you know, just a, a value that um, was instilled in me in a young age. So when I'm looking at, okay, what can I do with, you know, my skill in science um, that also combines that, you know, giving back to the community, um, helping others, is sort of like medicine was a no-brainer. Um, originally, with my rural background, my plan was to be a rural family doctor, <laughs> you know, and find myself somewhere in a small town in Oregon, you know, doing everything from delivering babies um, all the way to, you know, geriatrics. And um, OHSU um, at the time was also really pushing that, you know, the rural medicine track. In fact, I spent um, a week, uh, this was just a few weeks before I started medical school, a week um, in Prineville. So out in the middle of Oregon um, with a family doc out there and, you know, went to the high school football game on Friday and, you know, went to the ER when he got called with some, one of his older patients. And so it just sort of solidified my, you know, desire to, to do medicine. Um, 
then I entered medical school and, and when it came time to be looking at getting, you know, establishing a career um, and a specialty, I sort of um, decided that I wanted to focus more, that it was just hard to, you know, be good at everything across that broad spectrum and I really wanted to, to focus in. So I ended up being a gastroenterologist. Um, I actually started out my first year uh, as a, a general surgeon, so I was gonna do general surgery. Um, but after um, my internship year in general surgery, I realized that what I was missing in surgery was that um, side of my brain in medicine where you figure out what the problem is um, and also sort of the long-term contact with patients. You know, surgeons are often, you know, told, here you go, there's a bad gallbladder, take it out. You know, they do it, it's great. And then the, they may never see the patient again. Mm -hmm. um, so I, one of the reasons I got into medicine was that that desire to be the detective, you know, and figure out what's going on. Somebody comes to you with a complaint and your job is to figure it out. And so gastroenterology, I had knew nothing about it until my year in surgery. Um, and those two specialties work a lot together, um, you know, with the internal organs and everything. So um, I found that GI was great because it combined both that cognitive part, figuring out what's going on. Um, there's also chronic diseases in GI, you know, like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, that kind of stuff where, you know, you'll be able to follow patients for 20, 30 years, you know, during your career um, and really get to know them. Um, and then it also combined the other thing I loved, which is the hands-on part of medicine, which was, you know, a problem that you could fix right then and there. So being able to do endoscopy and that. So it was like, the perfect career for for me and my brain so that's why i gave up the dream of being the small town rural doctor and focused on gastroenterology um finished my training in gi in 2001 that's that's when we bought this place started my career um and ended my career at saint vincent so i was uh, originally hired by a group of uh, at the time there were six gastroenterologists um, uh, it was really, there was one other private practice guy, but uh, it was, they were the predominant group there and they hired me um, in 2001 uh, and I stayed there the entire time. We eventually joined the Oregon Clinic, which is a big multi-specialty clinic, uh, but um, I had a great career, you know, in medicine at St. Vincent. Um, it was great that I ended up at St. Vincent too, because back to those things that are important to me, like history and community and all that kind of thing. Um, I, St. Vincent was kind of our like local hospital. So I actually had my appendix removed <laughs> at St. Vincent when I was 12 <laughs> and then um, ended up and it was actually his last month of his career. Um, he was actually a surgeon who was also a sheep farmer. So that, again, that connection between <laughs> the doctor and the, and the farm. Um, I ended up uh, working with him, the guy who took out my appendix. I, when I was a surgery intern, I ended up um, uh, assisting him in surgery and working with him in surgery during his last month of the career. So it was kind of this full circle thing, you know, cause that's when I decided I wanted to be a doctor was when I had my appendix removed, you know, at age 12. So it was that, that was really cool. And then, to be able to practice my entire career there in the midst of the community I grew up in was incredibly, um, it was just an incredible gift. And then finally, the last two years, I was the president of the medical staff at St. Vincent. So it was really this sort of, like I say, again, full circle moment. Um, and then I decided to retire because I had other things I wanted to do. <laughs> you know, I had, I had achieved everything I could in medicine, loved my career, um, loved the people, you know, the nurses, the physicians I worked with, patients that I got to take care of. It was such a blessing. Um, but I also wanted to retire young enough that I could explore other interests. So at 56, I retired from medicine and now I'm getting to, you know, explore this other uh, a passion of mine in the wine industry. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. So I guess condolences because this isn't really a retirement. <laughs> no, job, it's not really, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations nope. anyway. Uh, tell me how you and Melissa met. Yeah, so we went to high school together. So technically not high school sweethearts. Um, 
uh, but yeah, we went to high school together. She um, went to the small Catholic um, grade school in Roy, Oregon, uh, through eighth grade, and then transferred to Banks High School um, uh, as a freshman. And so that would have been 1982. And we just ran in the same crowd, the same kind of friend group, um, you know, throughout our four years um, at Banks. And our senior year, we started to just get closer and um, our, our senior graduation night um, party, so all night party, um, we spent most of the night just hanging out together and having a great time. And on the bus ride home, I asked her out. <laughs> and so that was our first official date. Um, as I told you earlier, I went on to Willamette. Um, Melissa went to PCC and became an orthodontic assistant. Um, and then we actually got married um, November of my senior year at Willamette. And uh, so, yeah, we've be 35 years um, this November that we've been together. So, yeah. It's great. So it's great that, you know, again, we have, we have such a shared history, um, but also shared values, you know, around, again, like I was saying before, the land. And, and to a certain degree, she puts up with my passion. Um, certainly this, this was really my passion, the wine stuff. Um, she's been a great supporter of that and has been, you know, instrumental in helping us get to where we need to be to. Um, but, you know, she's like, this is your deal. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um, be be before it became time to actually, before the, before the sabbatical, before you actually kind of started to dive into this, yeah. tell me about your own kind of personal wine education, both on a, as a consumer of wine and also as a kind of a future producer of wine. Tell me about starting to learn wine and 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 what, what attracted you about it? What, what made you want to keep learning and, and, and dive into the industry? Yeah, I mean, that's, that is a, a, a great question with, as you might imagine, a lot of you know, interweaving stories and, and things that happen just by chance. Um, certainly, like I said before, wine to me, um, you know, when you're looking for a beverage, you know, to pair with friendship, to pair with social circumstances, to pair with food, you know, wine um, always intrigued me. And um, both from the standpoint of my palate, but also, like you say, just there's such an opportunity to like gain knowledge. There's so much knowledge to gain. Uh, as you were saying, like with the archives you guys are doing, I mean, look at the vast amount of knowledge there is around this industry. So that always appealed to that part of my brain, that sort of lifelong learner um, that I think you, you gain from doing professions, um, you know, whatever it is. You know, I mean, I think if you become a professional like that, you, you just have that in you, like that desire to learn more of whatever subject it happens to be. So wine, you know, always offered that. Um, like I say, I mean, back to the, the, my memory of the Ponzi thing and just growing up, you know, in, in wine country, um, there was always opportunity for that. So, you know, chances to go wine tasting at some of these beautiful properties, you know, started to become an option. Um, and then when I would do that, I would always want to know more than just like sit there and sip on a glass of wine. Um, so I just started that process whenever I would have an opportunity to ask questions, you know, to sort of get to know, just like you're doing here, like why wine, you know, why are, why do you, why did you start a winery? You know, what do you, uh, and then it just grew from there every time adding on to that knowledge. So I think, I think that's a big piece of it mm -hmm. is just that I saw um, my interest in wine as feeding that desire to, to find a subject I was interested in and then try to dive deeper into it. So tell me about this property. Obviously you mentioned you didn't buy it necessarily for a vineyard, but you certainly saw the potential here. So tell me about finding this space and, and seeing the potential in it. Yeah. So, um, that's a, that's a funny story too. So, 
I'm trying to remember the year it would have been. So we moved in here in 2001. So it would have been like, I graduated from medical school in 94. And so must have been around 97 or so, 98, I think before I went up and started my fellowship at OHSU. Um, Melissa, we were living in Bethany um, at the time. And so Melissa was driving from Bethany out to her parents' house in, in Roy, which is where she grew up. And she decided to take the back roads. And she'd actually never been up Mason Hill Road here, even though you know we've lived here for 50 plus years, both of us. So she just was kind of driving and decided to you know, check out Mason Hill Road and was driving up. And there was a for sale sign on this property. So this was like three or four years before we bought it. And we weren't in any position to buy it then. I was in training still and, you know, we just, it just wasn't going to happen. But she's like, I know where we, I want to live someday. And it, it was like, I was like, oh, cool. I mean, I, so she drove me by here and I, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. This property, the, the land here is beautiful. And then in 2001, when I was finishing up and getting my first real job, um, we started looking again to find a place to move to, and this property was for sale again. <laughs> it's just like, what are the odds, right? So, I like we were talking about before. I do have a I do have a little bit of belief in destiny sometimes, and you know, fate and how those things can work out for you. So, um, it just seemed right, and we did, you know, I, I did still at the time you know, have that desire to someday plant a vineyard. Mm -hmm. So it was not like, um, I don't think we would have bought it if it didn't have that potential. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a really important thing for me when we were looking for a property. So I think if it had been, you know, down in the flats and didn't have the right topography and didn't have, you know, that, that at least vision that I, we probably wouldn't have purchased it because that was important enough to me when we were gonna invest that, that it be that. So, you know, it wasn't an obviously a, a for sure thing, but again, knowing that there was a vineyard across the street, um, knowing that there, and at the time, you know, there aren't very many vineyards up here, even though it's now been designated a new AVA in the Tuolan Hills. Um, you know, I think Helvetia Vineyard was there still, um, Apolloni further out, which is just down the hill from where I grew up. Um, so we knew about them. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a bit of a risk, right? As far as that, that, uh, vision goes, but, um, certainly was in the, in my mind. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the process then you mentioned take, had the sabbatical, you mentioned kind of digging into it. Um, uh, what did you know at that point about putting in a vineyard and, and having a vineyard and what did you, what, what, what did you still have to learn? A lot. <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, like I, I didn't have a, you know, degree in viticulture or anything like that. I mean, I think the things that helped me were just my background of growing up on a farm. And so kind of, and then my father-in-law was a farmer, so I could ask him questions, even though he wasn't a vineyard owner, you know, just basic things. And um, I, I think a lot of it was finding the right people to surround me in the beginning to make sure that um, I wasn't just winging it, that, you know, I had people with knowledge to help me get there. Um, and then a lot of it was just, you know, on the job learning. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, so I say take the sabbatical. Even before the sabbatical, though, um, I'd been, you know, just reading, uh, trying to like I say, ask questions whenever I had an opportunity, starting to get to know people in the wine industry. So just um, slowly uh, increasing my knowledge about what it takes. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously critically important was my patient, the vineyard development guy who, you know, really helped me be sure I was making the right decisions when it came time to make the investment because it's not cheap, you know, to, to invest in a, a property. Um, I think the original investment was about $100,000, um, you know, just to get everything planted, uh, fencing put up, trellis system, everything done. Um, it was probably around $100,000 in that first couple of years before you get any, any crop. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah, the, uh, it was, it was that. And then through him, he introduced me to, um, our, uh, vineyard manager, um, uh, Valentin Mora, who is my vineyard manager today. In fact, he was just here this morning, um, out looking at the vineyard and deciding, you know, what our next steps were going to be. And again, I mean, some of that was just fortuitous, you know, that I got the right guy. Um, but Valentin, um, it's a whole nother fascinating story, um, Valentin's story and our relationship, but um, couldn't have done it without him and his knowledge and his um, just desire to really do the right thing. Um, and so between um, getting the right consultation with the venue developer and having Valentin on board, you know, that really made a, a huge difference in being successful um, for us. So got to give a lot of kudos. Mm -hmm. So I think this might be a good time to tell you a little bit about Valentin, because I think as far as archives go, that's that part of the story is like super important in Oregon and and how these vineyard workers have really contributed um, to this the success that Oregon has had. So Valentin's story is he grew up in this tiny town um, northwest of Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, up in the mountains. And I had the incredible um, opportunity to go visit that town a year ago, January. So, I mean, it's just amazing. So he grows up in this small town. I think it's maybe 500 people in this town. 95% of them are indigenous, um, my, or uh, Aztec um, background and ethnicity. Very little opportunity in that town. You know, it's just, it's mountainous. Um, the land there isn't really great at growing much other than the subsistence things that they do, rice and beans. Um, I mean, not rice and beans, uh, corn and beans. And so, you know, he just looking for opportunity. And so starts at first finding opportunities for jobs um, in Mexico. So, you know, having to go elsewhere at a young age um, and then coming back to his hometown with whatever funds he could get. At 18, he built his own house, which I got a chance to, to um, stay in when I was there. Crazy. Um, and then, you know, over time, as he gained his skill and knowledge in the agricultural stuff in Mexico, and I can't remember how, what connection he had to Oregon, but eventually he makes his way um, to Oregon. And his um, first job, I think it was his first job in the, in the vineyards, was with Beaufrere. Um, and he, I think he worked at Beaufrere for 10 or 12 years, something like that. So, I mean, obviously Beaufrere is, you know, one of the pre premier um, vineyards with a lot of history in Oregon, um, doing some great stuff. So I think he learned a ton um, there. And then he and his two brothers, also from that town in Mexico, um, started their own business. And so it's called Vineyard Labor Contractors. And so they work for a number of different vineyards providing um, labor contracting. And, uh, you know, Valentin and I have just developed this great relationship over time to the point where, like I said, he invited me back to his hometown, which was like such a privilege um, to get to do that. It was just amazing. Um, Valentin is just one of those stand-up guys, always looking to make sure that, you know, we're making the right decisions. Um, uh, cost conscious, um, incredibly fair, um, and really dedicated. In fact, there was one quote he told me this one time, he goes, I, I, I hope you don't mind, he goes, but I think of these grapes as my own children. I know they're yours, but I, I think of them as my own. And I said, oh my gosh, yeah, of course. You know, this is as much yours as it is mine. I mean, we've built this together. Mm -hmm. So um, just, you know, have an incredible amount of respect and and great uh, gratitude, you know, toward what Valentin has done to help us get to where we are today and hopefully we'll continue that, you know, relationship. That's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Really cool. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the vineyard. Um, what did you, how did you plant it? What did you plant? How did you make the decision yeah. what to plant? And uh, tell us a little about, about the layout. Yeah. So um, again, back to the 
um, consultation with Vineyard Developer. Um, so he gave me sort of some choices, said, you know, here's what he thinks the um, varieties that would be good to grow here. Here's the root stock that he recommended. Um, and then that was sort of one of the first decisions. It's like, what varieties are we going to plant? Um, I ended up picking Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris. Again, back to my own um, love of history and love of Oregon wine history. To me, it was an homage to um, that. So Pinot Noir, the red wine grape that sort of put Oregon on the map. Um, also, my certainly if not the number one favorite, it's top three favorite of my own personal wine varietals for consumption. So that was an easy decision for me. Pinot Gris was, um, two factors went into making that decision. Maybe the most important was it's Melissa's favorite wine <laughs> varietal. So, so that was, um, there was a heavy influence on her side of like, if we're gonna do a white too, um, we should do Pinot Gris. But it also fit in again to my own personal thing. Pinot Gris was again, one of the first white varietals that was successful in Oregon and is still the you know, um, number two uh, grape in Oregon um, behind Pinot Noir. So um, again, both from a personal standpoint of the wines that we like, but also you know, just to try to honor that history. Um, and so that was the main decision making there. But yeah, I had to, obviously not a viticulturist, had to lean heavily on recommendations um, from the experts. And so that's how we ended up there. So 2001, um, in fact, we just celebrated our, on April 1st was our 10 year anniversary of the planting of the vines. So April 1st, 2014, um, I posted on my Instagram account, the little pictures of these, you know, like eight inch long sticks. <laughs> Um, in the ground and no trellises at the time, you know, it was all just, uh, you know, uh, Valentin and his crew uh, mapped it out. Um, the vine spacing was again something that was recommended by the um, developer. Um, we have uh, uh, seven by five vine spacing, um, seven feet row distance, mostly, I mean, it's pretty common anyway, but mostly because it allows you to get a relatively standard tractor in there. So it makes you know farming a lot easier. Um, so it's a super common row spacing um, in Oregon. Um, obviously, there's many other ways to do it, and Burgundies are crazy. Um, uh, Bergstrom, um, John Bergstrom actually practiced. He was a physician too. I don't know if you know that story with with John, but John. Um, was in practice at St. Vincent when I started. So I, I just kind of, he was kind of my vision too. Grew up in a small town himself in Southern Oregon, you know, and then got into the wine industry after a career in medicine. So I always sort of looked at him as, um, you know, a mentor in that way and sort of a visionary of what I might be able to do someday. I mean, obviously he's done incredibly well and what Josh has done. Um, uh, but they have right outside there, if you haven't visited their tasting room there, as you drive in, they have like an experimental plot of like burgundy plantings where I think it's like two by four. It's like this. I don't even know how you farm that, <laughs> but, but crazy. So anyway, we, um, we chose that. Uh, like I say, since it was our 10 year anniversary of planting the vines on April 1st, I was looking back at photos and you know, bags of flour where they were dropping where the vines needed to go, you know, and doing all the spacing. Um, never forget that first year. It, it was uh, a real eye opener as to how fast these vines grow. Um, Cause it did grow along the ground the first year. So no trellising or anything. It was like 25 feet, you know, of growth <laughs> um, from this little stick. It was just nuts. So, uh, and then the next year, the trellis system was put in um, and started that training process. So that would have been 2015. Um, and then 2016 um, was our first uh, yield. Mm -hmm. Was the plan always to make your own wine? Um, I think eventually, it wasn't a for sure thing. I think more than anything, like I said before, my, my background was more in the farming side of stuff. and wanting to be that good steward and wanting to do something with our land that was productive and and all that so uh 
I think for sure it was um, a goal that I had thought of a lot about and would hope that someday I could do it, but didn't know for sure, you know what I mean? Because that's a big, it's a whole nother big commitment. And so initially it was like, well, we're just gonna commit for right now to try to you know, raise the best quality grapes that we can, learn about that side of it, do that, and then sell it. Um, so that's a good segue into how did we start bottling our own wine. So like I said, 2016 was our first yield. Um, we uh, uh, do this uh, double gill system um, with the VSP trellis system. So that first year, 2016, you just do a single gill, and then, and so you get about half the normal production. And I really didn't know like who I was going to sell it to, you know, even like what to sell it for. So, so I went on the um, wine business classifieds and started looking around and seeing what pricing was and doing my own research in that and asking around and knowing that like nobody knew who the hell Shoemaker Vineyards was. Like, why would they buy my wine, my grapes? And so um, it was like a loss leader year. So I, I priced it at like half of, you know, what um, sort of the going rate was. I think at the time for Pinot Noir, I think the average was somewhere around $2,400 a, a ton. And so I priced mine at 1200 a ton. I got one call. <laughs> But that's all I need, right? So one call from um, this guy, Ryan Hewitt. Um, he was the head winemaker at Laurel Ridge at the time. And he was um, making his own wine there too under his own label, Hewitt Cellars. And so he was intrigued when he was looking to buy fruit because he didn't have his own vineyard or anything. And so when he was looking through the classifieds, what he was intrigued about was that it was the first yield. So he, he's, I mean, you only get one of those. Every vineyard only gets one time where it's the very first yield. So he was intrigued as a winemaker about like what that would look like. You know, what, what, is, what is wine made from the very first year of production look like? And so that was what really prompted him to purchase it. Plus it was a good price, mm -hmm. you know? So um, when you're making small batch like he was, that was important to him too. So he, um, you know, agree. He comes out here, like takes a look at it, says it looks great, and ends up buying our fruit that year. And we also bought the Pinot Gris um, at, at the same time. And so that was 2016. And so I hauled it out to, you know, at harvest time, hauled it out to Laurel Ridge where he was making it, did the crush out there. Um, it was so exciting for me, like that first, like, this is, har harvest is amazing. I don't know if you've had a chance to like, you know, be at a harvest, you know, watching it being picked and then crushed. And it's just such a fun time. It's hard work, but it's so rewarding. So, I mean, talk about really lighting the fire in my passion that first year to take my fruit out there and watch it be processed and all that was amazing. So uh, Ryan makes wine that first year. Um, he blends our grapes, the Pinot Noir with uh, three other vineyards. Um, and so it was a blend, and then he makes Pinot Gris uh, from ours, and we, we, we loved him. We're like, oh, this is really good, you know, just personally. And then 2017 and 2018, he liked our grapes so much that he decided to do single vineyard um, uh, bottling of our wines. And so 2017 and 2018, and both those years, the Pinot Noirs scored 92 points from wine enthusiasts. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> maybe this could be, you know, critically uh, uh, appreciated wine as well from what we're doing. So 2019 rolled around um, and unfortunately, um, Ryan wasn't able to continue to purchase our wine or our grapes. So I was in this quandary of like, well, now what do I do? You know, and so trying to find somewhere else. He had been making his wine, he'd left Laurel Ridge by that point and was making his wine at Chris James Cellars in Carlton. And so I had met Chris Barnes, um, the owner of Chris James Cellars, because uh, Chris James is his first and middle name. Um, I'd met Chris because Ryan was making his wine in 17 and 18 up there, his leasing space. 
So when Ryan wasn't able to keep doing it, I asked Chris if he would want to buy it. He goes, because I really don't, you know, financially want to purchase the fruit and all of it. He goes, but um, very graciously, and I give Chris so much credit for this, he agreed to take our Pinot Gris and some of our Pinot Noir, because he wanted to make an orange wine out of the Pinot Gris. He had, he's kind of a mad scientist, so he wanted to experiment with making an orange wine out of our Pinot Gris. Um, and then he made Pinot Noir for us. And that was sort of like, okay, I mean, either I try to sell it as bulk wine, which is like not great, um, or we decide to slap our name on a label and go from there. So that was how it, we kind of got pushed into it a little earlier than we thought. But um, 2019 was our um, very first uh, bottling. So obviously that sat in barrel until early in 2021. Um, so it wasn't until 2021 that we had our first bottle with our name on it that now we had to figure out how to, to sell it. But you know, that's life, right? You know, stuff happens and, and you know, you do what you can and, and ultimately it was, it's worked out fantastic. Um, and uh, Chris has been our winemaker, you know, ever since. And so it's been great. So tell me about that first, the first vintage when it came out in 2021. What's it like having wine with your name on it? What's it like selling your own wine? Well, that's two different questions. <laughs> <laughs> having wine with your own label on it, your own name on it is, is like just such a gift, you know. Um, back to that whole story in a bottle. And when we do, when I do wine tastings um, and I talk to people about our story, that's, one of the things that's fascinating about a single vineyard thing is it really is, you know, a story in a bottle and each year is different. And because I live in the middle of it, like I know. So that first bottling, it wasn't just that year too, right? It was the culmination of all that we've been talking about is finally what the ultimate goal was. So, oh yeah, it was, it was incredible. Um, amazing. And then to be able to share that with family and friends too, and it was super exciting. And then the reality of how you sell wine is a whole nother thing. And you've probably talked to many winemakers, you know, m most winemakers love making wine, but selling it is not their forte. <laughs> the marketing and, and sale of wine is a whole nother beast. And so there are challenges there for sure. And that process has been a slow evolution for us. So it started out with, um, so let's see, that would have been then early 21. So 2020, um, we, we had decided to use all of our fruit for our own wine now. So we weren't going to sell any fruit. So we made that decision after we decided that we were in 2019 going to bottle our own wine. Um, so that year, 2020's vintage, um, knowing that we had wine in barrel that was going to be bottled soon, we decided to go all in. So we had a Pinot Gris, um, that, a still Pinot Gris that got bottled in early 21 as well. Um, we wanted to expand our offerings beyond just a still Pinot Noir and a, and a still Pinot Gris. So we ended up bottling a um, sparkling rosé from our Pinot Noir. Um, and that's a whole nother story about how that came to be. But so 2020, early 2021, we now had bottles of our 2019 Pinot, our 2020 Pinot Gris, our 2020 um, uh, Sparkling Rosé. And so to start, we were like, okay, a lot of it was just word of mouth, you know, selling to friends and family. And that was kind of enough that first year to kind of get our feet wet and figure out how to do that. Um, I can't remember if in 21 that we did any events or anything. I think we did some small kind of things. Um, 22 was when we really started kicking it up and figuring out how we were going to um, market this. So we've been doing some of the larger events, you know, like First Taste Oregon. And um, uh, last year, we or this year, we did the Portland Seafood and Wine Festival. Um, we've done a number of small events in Hillsboro, which is, you know, the closest city to us. And so they've 
done wine events there. Um, uh, we sell our wine in two retail locations at the Helvetia Farm Market just up the street here. Um, James, um, the wine buyer and educator there, has been super supportive of hyper local stuff and his offerings. And then we're in Jim's supermarket in Banks, um, where we grew up, which is super fun. And the, the owner of Jim's was a classmate of ours from, she was one year ahead of us in Banks. Um, his dad owned it when we were in high school. And so we've got our own little display in the aisle, you know, for Shoemaker Vineyards, this hometown, hometown wine owner, winery owners. So, um, yeah, so and a lot of it's just been kind of word of mouth events. And we do just kind of private by invitation, sit down here, you know, um, in the back patio and look out at the vineyard. Um, but it's time to move, you know, now that I'm retired, like we've got to start moving inventory. Um, we got to see how this works beyond just it being, um, you know, local family, friends kind of thing. So um, our wines have been super well received by the public. And so that's been super helpful. We've done, the Pink Rosé Festival the last two years and get comments like, your guys is the best and we love it and people join the wine club because of that and then they buy more and so, um, but we're at a point now where we really have to try to make this work um, from a business perspective. So uh, two things that have happened in the last six months or so that, um, that are gonna push us that direction one was um, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, Hallie, um, got married in 21 and had our first grandchild, my grandson, Carter, Carter Drew McKenzie, thank you, last July. So she has a degree from Gonzaga um, in marketing and finance. And so she'd been working in the corporate world um, since she graduated. When Carter was born, she decided that she wanted to stay at home. Um, to raise him and so left her corporate world job um, and has been now working um, for Shoemaker Vineyards as our director of marketing. And so she's bringing all of that knowledge that I don't have um, to bear uh, on this. And so um, she's been really instrumental. It's been super fun uh, us working together on this. Um, and in fact, we went to the Oregon Wine Symposium together, you know, went to different lectures and, and just to hang out with her and have her start to learn about the wine industry too and hopefully continue this family tradition uh, is awesome. So she, um, she's been working with me on that. Our next big thing that we really, I think, need to do to make this viable is to build a tasting room because um, we just need to have that. We need to be able, be able to be open year round. People love coming out here in this setting and so to be able to have a tasting room here, I think is what most people are looking for. You know, urban tasting rooms are great, um, but I think a lot of people, especially where we're located, really love this coming out here. And because we're like 10 or 15 minutes from the Beaverton, Hillsboro suburbs, uh, people are like, I don't have to drive 45 minutes or an hour to Newburgh, this is fantastic. Um, so they can get out of their cul-de-sac and get out here and sit in this beauty and, and drink good wine, I think is um, an opportunity for us. And there's not a lot of it, so right now there's not huge competition in this area, so I think if we can get going on that. So we're just in the process of working with the county to get the permitting done and things like that, and we're hopeful that we should be able to start um, building by fall time and hopefully by you know, sometime in the winter, or early spring, we can open the tasting room too. But I think that's gonna be key for a small boutique winery like ours is to have that option. I mean, that's how you get people interested in what you're doing and you can tell your story and they can see it. So yeah, so that's where we are. That's a lot going on. Yeah, it's yeah, exciting. yeah, very exciting. But yeah, back to the, um, family stuff, uh, it's funny because, you know, I'm the first generation now, Melissa and I are the first generation in the wine industry, you know, vineyard owners. Um, we just got back from the south of France and we spent one night too in um, Piedmont in Italy in uh, Lamora near Barolo in the Barolo area. And 
we went to this, we actually stay, there's like four rooms above this winery that had been there since 1841. And these just beautiful rooms with views out over the, I don't know if you've been to Piedmont, but oh my, this my, was my first time. Like 80% of the land that you look out over in these rolly hills is vineyards. It's just vineyard after vineyard after vineyard. And so um, this winery that was started in 1841 was the earliest like official winery um, designated in, in, in Barolo. Um, it's been continuously owned by the same family. So in chatting with the, the, the guy that was doing the wine tasting with us and telling him our story too, um, pretty soon the sixth generation owner, <laughs> Alessandro comes down. <laughs> and uh, so I had brought a bottle of our Pinot Noir and I shared it with him and he shared a bottle of the Barolo. And, and I was saying, I said, yeah, I said, well, my daughter's second generation. <laughs> so we got a ways to go to catch up with you guys. But we also tasted another winery in um, uh, Chateau Neuf de Pop, and they were fourth generation, you know, met the owners. So you see a lot of that. And like you're saying, we're in that place in Oregon right now that you're starting to see what's going to happen. Like, is this getting passed on to family? Is it getting purchased by others? So it's kind of an interesting time, you know, to see, are we going to be like some of these European areas where you have that kind of history, where you're going to have four, five, six generations um, of vineyard owners 200 years from now or, or what? You know, how is this going to morph? Because it's, it's that time, like you say, where the original guys are, are retiring or moving on and whatever. And so what's going to happen here? It's, it's fascinating. Um, 2020, uh, it was a, pardon my French shit show, right? <laughs> so... 2020 um, rolls around and uh, again, it was the first year that we were gonna use all of our production uh, for our own wines. So it was a different sort of thinking process. So instead of just saying, okay, what does Ryan want? You know, and how are we gonna farm what he wants mm -hmm. to what do we want? Like, what do we wanna put our name on and how do we wanna be marketable? What do we like, you know? And so again, it, we were looking at wanting to add something different than just a still Pinot Gris and a still Pinot Noir, um, just to have more variety for people. And um, I don't know if you can see right now, but um, I always tell this story when people are out here tasting too. So that big block that's up there near the road is um, Pomard clone of Pinot Noir. It's about an acre's worth. And it goes up right against the um, trees that our neighbors have there. And so those trees change the like at least six or seven, eight rows um, closest to the trees with how they respond. Mm -hmm. So if you went out there too, you would even see that the first row or two, like tiny vines just really have struggled to develop as much as the rest of the, um, that block. And um, both because of shade, because like even now you can see it's starting to shade that those rows on that block, but also just competition from the trees. So um, as I'm out there starting to, you know, test bricks at harvest that I started seeing over the last couple of years is that those rows just didn't mature as fast. So chatting with Chris, the winemaker and thinking about it, it was like, well, if you're gonna make rosé from Pinot Noir, you actually wanna harvest it when it's less ripe anyway. Um, and you don't necessarily wanna drop fruit, you wanna have higher acidity, um, you know, lower sugar content, so therefore lower alcohol. So it's kinda of like that adage, you know, um, make lemonade when you're given lemons. So we just had this part of that block that was n probably never, unless the, they removed the trees, gonna ripen as much as the rest. So we decided to make rosé and then we were like, okay, we'll do a rosé, but let's just, let's make it sparkling too. Um, just to be so different from the other two things that we were doing and see how that goes. Um, Chris Barnes, who has been making our wine, um, doesn't have the facility or the um, experience in, in making uh, sparkling wine from the champagne method or tank method. And so, his sparkling wines have always been um, forced carbonation. Mm -hmm. 
So we did that uh, forced carbonation wine in Rosé in 2020, and it was just a huge hit. Like everybody just loved it. Um, everybody who tasted it. It was like very few people didn't like it. And so we were like, okay. <laughs> you know, from a, again, marketing standpoint, it was like, well, we obviously need to keep doing this. Um, and then, so in 2022, we also, or um, 2021, we also decided to do some forced carbonation of our Pinot Gris. Mm -hmm. So we call it our Blanc de Blancs. So we now every year have um, a sparkling rosé from our Pinot Noir and a sparkling Pinot Gris. Um, both of which, the sparkling Pinot Gris has actually become our number one seller um, over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so we've continued to do that. And then um, uh, because the rosé was uh, such a hit, we now do a still rosé as well, which has also been, been super popular. So yeah, so out of every vintage now, the last couple of vintages, we get at least five bottles out of this two and a third acres of grapes, about 3,000 vines, two varieties. So we get um, the still Pinot Gris and Pinot Noir every year. The last two vintages, we've also done um, kind of a reserve or select, barrel select bottling too. Because um, of barrel tasting, we've found some exceptional barrels that we've sort of held out of the blended one. Um, and then we have the two sparkling wines and then the still rosé. So. Yeah, it always amazes me, like out of such a small, you know, plot. And we get about five or 600 cases a year, typically. But yeah, so that's the rosé story kind of um, has worked out great, you know, and taking, taking advantage of what nature gives you. It's just part of being a farmer. Well, as long as we're talking about 2020, I'm, I'm curious, your experience in 2020 being in the medical profession still at that point. Tell yeah. us about that year, both on the wine side and on the medical side. Yeah. So on the medical side, it was surreal. You know, I mean, um, you know, once they sort of lockdown occurred and all of this, when we really realized that this was here in the U.S., it wasn't going away, this was serious, um, you know, everybody gets kind of sent home. And, but as a physician, you can't do what you do from home. Um, interestingly, we found that we can do a lot more remotely than we used to be able to do. And that's one of, I think, the benefits of COVID that's happened is people be able to do some visits now remotely, which just wasn't allowed before because insurance wouldn't pay for it. Technology really wasn't there. Patients hasn't accepted that as an option. Um, but otherwise, you know, I had to go to work, you know, and take care of patients. And so it was really, like I say, it was surreal. Um, the first several weeks, we actually, a lot of what we were doing was shut down. So we had no ability to do elective stuff. So as a gastroenterologist, endoscopy, colonoscopy, like we couldn't do any of that unless it was truly an emergency. So most of what we were doing was, you know, talking to patients over, over Zoom or yeah, so the first like a couple of weeks, especially at the hospital, um, was just really strange because it was almost like a ghost town. Yeah, uh, because again, no elective surgeries or elective stuff, and so um, just the amount of people that were there, and really everybody except for essential people were sent home as we were trying to figure this all out. So it was it was bizarre, you know, and that whole concept of being masked, and so you know, I mean, I was it at work masked for three years or whatever, two, three years, you know, so totally changed so many things um, in medicine. And so it was, I mean, it, like I say, I think the word surreal best describes it because it's like nothing we could comprehend, nothing we'd ever been through before. Um, so, uh, you know, that was, I think, what, March or whatever, when the lockdown started in 2020. Um, the first memory I have of the combination of COVID in the vineyard was my daughter um, had just started dating this, my youngest daughter had just started dating this guy. I think they were both 16. And, you know, of course, they just want to be able to get together, but it's COVID. <laughs> and so, you know, they can't go out and they can't, you know, hang out and all that kind of thing. 
So I was um, burning the prunings. Uh, this was like, again, this was like March or whatever. And so I said, well, you know, um, Gavin can come over, Annika, but you know, you guys need to be outside. And if you're gonna be outside, you might as well be helping me. <laughs> so one of their first dates was, you know, picking up prunings and throwing it into the bin to burn it and all that. So, so I don't know how, what their memory, I should ask them again sometime, like, what did you guys think about that? <laughs> but they got to hang out together and, and they're still dating. They're, you know, living together and probably get married someday. So I guess it was a, it was not a bad start <laughs> to their relationship. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and then going on from the vineyard standpoint of 2020, obviously the grapevines didn't care about COVID. Um, but in June of 2020, when flowering occurs, uh, if you've seen grapevine flowers, they're tiny little delicate things and they self-pollinate. And that sort of week of bloom in 2020, um, we had really unseasonably cold weather and a fair amount of rain. So fruit set is what they call it when it goes from bloom to setting the fruit was not good. It was like half. Um, and this was the way kind of across the, um, you know, the valley for most vineyards because of that. And so if you looked at a cluster of grapes from our vineyard in 2020 by the end um, versus, you know, the year before or the year after, um, if you counted the number of berries on a cluster, it was like half the number of berries. The berries were smaller too, as they just didn't get that sort of good start with fruit set. And so we had about half the yield. So um, I think in 2019, we had like 195 cases of Pinot Noir. In 2020, I think we had like 90. Um, so it was just the yield that year was far, you know, far less. And then, of course, the other thing about 2020 was the wildfires. So um, thankfully, we we're at the far northwest corner of the Willamette Valley, and most of the fires were, you know, further south. And even though there was smoke in the air um, here, um, we didn't develop any detectable smoke taint. So we were able to produce um, a Pinot Noir that um, just a lot less and all, all very different from any of the Pinot Noirs we've produced too, because of the small berries and the small clusters and very concentrated fruit that year. So it was, a, it was just an interesting year all the way around, right? So both from my professional side of things, just every day not knowing what it was gonna be to also being the first year that we were doing our own thing in our vineyard, um, to having my uh, baby girl dating for the first time, <laughs> to, um, you know, the challenges, the first like big challenges, because 16, 17, 18, and 19, for the most part had been pretty good, you know, easy years in the vineyard, nothing, nothing too dramatic. So to have weird fruit set at flowering, you know, smoke at the end, it was, and, and the first year we were doing it, it was, it was an auspicious year for sure. Mm -hmm. It's a tough year to be the first year you were doing anything. Oh yeah. Right? The first year before. So many ways. Yeah. 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 So, but it worked, it, it, it worked out good. You know, like I say, um, we were, super worried about things like the smoke and what that was going to do. Um, the rosé wasn't affected by it at all, neither was the Pinot Gris. And like I say, maybe there was a hint of smokiness, but no smoke taint. And my understanding of that is that the chemicals that um, produce that particular flaw called smoke taint, there's a couple of them at least, that get into the skins, are really mostly the closer you are. So proximity to the wildfire makes a big difference. So the further you get away from a wildfire, the less those chemicals are in the smoke um, and in the atmosphere. So you you just don't get that um, that problem. But yeah, there, I mean, there were vineyards that year that I knew that weren't even like, they were just dropping their fruit on the ground. They didn't make any. Others were making rosés or white Pinot Noir, or, you know. Some got lucky that harvested some of their grapes before Labor Day. But yeah, it was uh, very challenging. <laughs> um, very challenging time for all the vineyards um, in the valley. T tell me about your role in the vineyard as it's grown uh, what do you what what do you contribute what is what is your favorite part of working with having a vineyard here 
Yeah, I mean, there's a few favorites. I mean, I love getting on my tractor and being out there and being hands-on with it. And so um, just like the other day, I was finishing up with, um, you know, just by myself, by hand with the weed eater. Um, uh, the weeds had grown up a fair amount within the rows, so they were starting to get up into the fruit zone. So um, we had to get the weeds out, get good, you know, air circulation and not let the, if the weeds get up into the fruit zone too, they can carry some disease with them. So, so yeah, I mean, it's hard, hard work, but um, having grown up on a farm, I was never afraid of that kind of hard work. And there's just something incredibly satisfying about putting in, in um, your AirPods and either listening to a good podcast. Now I have some new ones <laughs> to listen to, um, or listening to music and and just you know work in there. It's incredibly um, uh, therapeutic for me. So actually being out there and doing some of that stuff, whether it's on the tractor or some of these other things, some of it I just can't physically do it all in a timely enough manner, like and don't have the skill to do like the pruning and the hedging because you know the Valentino bring out a crew of six, eight people and they'll be able to do it all, you know, in a day. Um, but yeah, I love that. I absolutely love that. And, you know, so I used to cherish those times. Um, the last five years I was in practice, I only worked three days a week. So I went to part time first. And so it allowed me to have more time to do some of that in the vineyard. Um, I also love the interaction with the winemaker and talking about you know, the fruit and what they need and what they're getting. And so that sort of just academic uh, process is super fun to me and, and enjoyable. Um, and then uh, uh, now that I'm retired, my goal is to become even more knowledgeable and involved on the wine growing side of things. So I'm planning to take the viticulture program at Chemeketa um, starting this fall winter um, so I um, that's my plan for this next year is to to learn that side to get my own knowledge of it so that I can apply my own knowledge and influence on it moving forward um, that's super important to me I mean I like I say I've been blessed to have great people around me that have allowed me to produce great fruit, but at some point I, f I feel this obligation and this desire to be even more hands-on and really know what I'm doing. So I'm looking forward to that. You talked earlier about some of your kind of initial impressions of Oregon wine going all the way back to childhood. Tell me about the ways that you've seen the industry grow and change as you've been paying attention to it, and what does the industry look like in 2024? Yeah. Um, so, uh, like I said, huge history buff, um, especially when it comes to our local history of wine in Oregon. So to that end, you know, I've read some books. Some of the recent ones that I read was The Boys Up North. I don't know if you've had a chance to read that, but, um, you know, kind of Dick Erath's story, but, you know, incorporates a lot of what the others were doing too. And um, I actually read that right after Dick passed. Um, and so, uh, fascinating stories, right, about how this all came to be to begin with. Um, there's another book called The Grail, um, which um, it's Adelsheim? Is that the? I can't remember now. Uh, it's uh, Lang. Yes, yes, Lang, that's right. Um, another great book on Oregon history. Um, Voodoo Vintners is another fascinating read, you know, to kind of understand um, the biodynamic, you know, uh, craze in Oregon and, and process. So, so some of my knowledge of that um, comes from me, you know, spending some time trying to learn about this and asking questions, you know, of the folks that I meet. And so I learn their story better. Um, obviously, I've only been in the wine industry, you know, since um, 2014 dipping my toe into it by planting the grapes, you know, and so I've had 10 years of sort of being in the industry to a certain degree, but nothing like these guys that have, you know, made a career and a living out of it and all that. So what have I seen change? Um, I think one of the things I've certainly seen change is it morphing like we were talking about earlier, 
Um, this, the wine industry in Oregon, when it started back to, you know, this hippie party at the Ponzi's, just kind of a neighborhood, you know, get together. Um, that was kind of how things were, you know, the, it was small families, small vineyards, um, really tight community, all very local. They weren't even sure it was going to work out, you know, so really supportive of each other, all of that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's really helped to uh, determine what the culture of wine is in Oregon. And it, it was always something that attracted me to the wine industry too. I think I so grateful to the number of people who have supported me you know there's just I've never felt that like um, concern about competition you know everybody wants everybody to do well and are willing to share their knowledge and and whatever they can to to make this work so um, I think what we're starting to see though and I think it's great in many ways but um, I think that presents maybe some challenges is uh, folks from outside the community of Oregon wine coming in and purchasing, um, you know, even like like Ponzi, you know, you know, back to Ponzi going from, you know, this little neighborhood vineyard to community vineyard to now, um, you know, being purchased by a large uh, conglomerate. And, and what is that going to mean, you know, for the Oregon wine industry? Um, obviously, it's great. It brings incredible uh, uh, recognition of what's going on in Oregon. So you get a guy like you mentioned earlier from Sweden, <laughs> probably wouldn't know about this in, and us if it weren't for some of this investment, this global interest. So it's not a, in my mind, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, but it does present some challenges of how we, you know, how we grow in that way and, and still allow folks like me and many other small vineyards and, and wineries to be successful. Um, when you start to get increasing, you know, corporate investment. So it's just how we manage that, I think, that's going to be critical, you know, over the next decade or so. Um, to that end, I've, you know, now again that I'm retired, um, I want to be involved in that side of things as well. Um, and I've talked with Lorene Apolloni. I don't know if you know Lorene or have met with her, but um, she was instrumental in getting our area designated as a new AVA, so the Twalen Hills AVA that was designated in 2020. Um, she was one of one of the handful of people in this area, winery owners, that was really crit you know critical in in getting that designation. I think now she's also serving on the. Um, uh, Explore Tualatin Valley, what used to be the Washington County Visitors Association board. I think she's the chairperson of the board now there. So um, I've chatted with her a number of times and like, how can we all work together, you know, to make sure not only that we grow Tualatin Hills AVA, but just Oregon wine in general. And how do we, you know, keep what makes us special, but also um, uh, promote us, you know, on a, a global level too which is why I took bottles of wine to France and Italy <laughs> and, and shared it there, you know, to try to show people what's going on. And, and uh, so, yeah, so I think, I mean, that's certainly what I've seen a change, especially in the last decade. Um, that's a big change. Um, I mean, this is, it may sound cliche, but um, climate change, I mean, certainly is on everybody's mind. Um, from things like the wildfires that I mentioned and what the threat of that might be, the increasing threat of that and how we're going to manage that, to, um, you know, farming practices. So I'm going to be very interested to see when I start the program at Chemeketa of, like, what the experts are thinking. Like, what kind of things do we need to change, you know, as far as our farming practices are concerned to continue to produce the kind of cooler climate grapes like Pinot Noir that we've been producing. So I, I see that as um, a challenge, but also potentially an opportunity. You know, I think that um, sometimes those kind of changes can provide, you know, present you with opportunities that you wouldn't have had before. Uh, so I, though it, it is a potential threat, um, I think a lot of us in the wine industry are looking at it as potentially an opportunity too. Certainly is allowing some people to plant different varieties. <laughs> You know, back to Chris Barnes, um, he's got some northern uh, Italian varietals that he's been growing, like Lagrine and Dolcetto, and, you know, you're seeing some of that pop up, 
you know, that people are able to experiment a little more with different stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, we've had, you know, the, the, the wildfire in 2020, but then in 2021, we had the heat dome. It's like 117 in June. Um, that was super challenging from that perspective too. Uh, so yeah, um, I think those are the two, the two big things that I see. Oh, the third one, <laughs> which is this, um, this concern about the health effects of alcohol. So, and as a physician, you know, obviously I can come at this with, you know, the perspective of, of a physician, you know, uh, uh, trained in medicine and healthcare, and what do these studies really mean, and how do we incorporate that into, you know, the health effects of, of alcohol, um, and how do we balance that with, you know, the obviously the benefits, especially of wine, you know, I mean, um, more so than probably any other alcoholic beverage, wine has this history um, in humanity that has brought so many benefits. You know, from religion to um, uh, social interactions to um, uh, food, like you having just come from France, you can't separate wine and food. You know, the development of the food in, in probably the gastronomic capital of the, of the world was so centered around wine as well. Like you can't separate the two and they, the, the food wouldn't have grown in the same way that, that wine does. Um, I mean, you think of all of, like I say, the social benefits too of wine from just friendships and hanging out and weddings and, um, and like I say, the stories that come behind it that enrich, you know, our experience of life. Um, obviously, any alcoholic beverage carries with it some health risk, and we have to be cognizant and, and care about um, overuse and abuse and, and the effects of that. Uh, and so uh, we shouldn't turn a blind eye to, you know, concerns about health. But the concern, I think, amongst the wine industry is like, is, you know, is it going to be unbalanced? And so, you know, it's going to threaten the livelihood of people in the wine industry because of those health concerns um, versus, you know, looking at the benefits too. Um, and so it's, again, trying to come to that balance, that risk benefit, which is something as a physician I did my entire career. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. Um, one last just comment on that. I read an article recently ab about that. And if you read the, if you just read the headlines, it's like any amount of alcohol is bad for you. Um, but if you dig into it, you know, a person drinking a moderate amount of alcohol, and this isn't guaranteed for anybody. This is just kind of an average, um, the study that they looked at, like, what does that really mean? And it can mean anywhere from like, maybe it'll shorten your life by a week or two, <laughs> you know? Um, and you, know, you balance that against, you know, the benefits of a lifetime um, of, of the positives around wine and the wine industry and all the stuff we've talked about before. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how we in the wine industry approach that challenge and how we get different messaging out um, uh, to people and so that it, it it doesn't become something that's an existential threat. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what's next for you. Obviously, you mentioned recent retirement, uh, yeah. pseudo retirement into this. Uh, tell me about, uh, in addition to the tasting room, what else is in the future? What else is uh, on your horizon, personally or professionally? Yeah, so for the, um, uh, so medicine wise, I've retired from clinic, regular clinical practice. I'm still planning to do volunteer work. I went to Guatemala in April um, and uh, volunteered down there on a medical mission down there. And I hope to be able to keep continuing to do that. Um, it's great. Oregon allows you as a sort of emeritus physician that you can keep a emeritus license um, so that you can do volunteer work too. So I'm hoping from that perspective to continue to do that, but really um, most of that, you know, being in healthcare is, is behind me and the, the new future for me personally is, is this obviously being a grandfather, um, which has been super exciting and so much fun. Um, 
in fact, he he's in California right now with my daughter and son-in-law because um, that's where he's from, my son-in-law. So they're down there visiting the other grandparents, but they come back tonight. So we get to get to see him again. We're so blessed to be him. He's like 25 minutes away. So we see him two or three times a week. Um, I have two other kids, my son and my youngest daughter too. So we expect to have this growing um, family. And so um, to have... Uh, as a, a, a fairly recent country song says, have a, a yard full of my kids' kids <laughs> is going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, from the vineyard standpoint, like I said, I'm hoping to take the viticulture classes so that I can really um, be involved in that side of it and better capable of making decisions um, around how we do the grape growing. Um, Chris uh, Barnes is giving up the custom crush stuff. so. Um, we actually just hired new winemakers to do our custom crush. So this is also a super exciting time. Give Chris so much credit. I mean, I could not have done this without him. His expertise and skill and producing really good wines has allowed us to, um, you know, grow our brand um, and, and get a, an amazing start that we couldn't have otherwise. Um, but I understand why, you know, he's busy and I, you know, I think I was at the end his only custom crush client. You know, it wasn't really part of his business. He did it really in the beginning as a favor to me. <laughs> so, um, like I say, incredible gratitude for what he did. And, but it offers, again, an opportunity, you know, change is threat and opportunity. Um, and so we hired uh, uh, Chad and Bree Stock. I don't know if you've had a chance to meet them too. So I'm super excited about what they might bring to this. You know, young, they bring a perspective from outside of Oregon, which I think is really cool. Chad having done his wine training in California. Um, Brie from Australia and has this, I think she's one of two or the only like masters, female masters of wine in the Pacific Northwest. So, and she has a global, you know, experience. Um, I think they complement each other so well. Um, we actually did, I did the interview with them right here. <laughs> and just fell in love with their passion and what they might bring. And so we're, from a winemaking perspective for us, we obviously want to stick with a lot of what we've been doing because that's what our wine club members want and our current fans, you know, know. So we don't want to do anything too crazy and different, but looking at opportunities. Um, uh, I've always been very curious about doing like indigenous yeast, you know, native yeast fermentation. Kind of comes back to my own like um, philosophy about life um, and, and understanding where wine originally came from. And then again, having visited some wineries in Europe recently, like most of them, that's what they do. Like they believe in that that sort of philosophy of winemaking of, you know, using native yeast, less, you know, um, less manipulation of the wine if you can get away with it. I mean, there's obviously some risk in that, but Chad, that's like his thing, you know. Um, Chris had no desire to do that and, and uh, um, didn't have the experience in that, but like Chad, like that's what he does. And so I'm very curious to see, you know, how that's going to, um, what we can bring out of that. He's super excited about it because he gets to work in a Twalen Hills vineyard, which he hasn't had a whole lot of chance to do other than David Hill. Um, so he's excited to be able to, you know, be involved with that. So that's another big change for us, you know, moving forward. Um, the two to three year plan is get the tasting room built, work with Chad and Bree, me get my degree, and then see if we can you know, um, sell out of our inventory of what we're doing here. If it really takes off and we're doing well, then, you know, we would look at things like leasing or purchasing more land, um, uh, buying fruit. I think as a predominantly wine grower, um, my, my desire would be to purchase land or at least lease land where I can be involved in that aspect of it instead of just purchasing fruit. Um, I like that I know the vineyard and I was involved in that and so know exactly where the grapes came from. Um, that fits my background and my, my philosophy. So 
I think if we were, were to expand, that would be the first thing I would, I would do. Um, although logistically, there may be a time where we have to, you know, source some fruit from elsewhere. But a lot of our story is that it's single vineyard. Everything that you're tasting here, everything that you're purchasing here comes right off of this plot. So you can look at it and know. And I think people, that appeals to, to people. So we don't want to lose sight of that either. All right, last question for you. Yeah. Uh, what's your biggest achievement? What are you proudest of? That's a that's a great question. I you know I don't think I'm there yet to be able to really um, to have that thought. I mean I'm I feel like I'm still really just getting started. Um, so at, at this point, I mean the the biggest achievement was just making this happen to begin with, you know, realizing that dream of planting the vineyard. And, but that was obviously just the very beginning. So I, I think my story is still very much unwritten. Um, I would love to see this uh, next 10, 20 years, you know, of, of growth, of, of continuing to grow and learn, of getting my family involved, like my daughter, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, she'll get into that. And um, we talk about my grandson coming out for vineyard camp in the summer and spending a week with me. <laughs> my youngest son, he used to go to farm camp because I told you my father-in-law had a pig farm. So he used to go to farm camp in the summer and spend a week with grandpa riding on the tractor and stuff. So we're going to have vineyard camp here. Probably not quite like Pinot camp, but... <laughs> <laughs> but maybe better than pig camp, though. So. Better than pig camp, yeah, right, right. <laughs> awesome. All the questions I have for you. Great. Anything I didn't ask that I should have or anything? We I don't think cover? so. Like and again, I apologize for my loquaciousness. I, oh, no. I can no. get talking and I can go. No, no apology. <laughs> That's the whole point here. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Appreciate Absolutely. your beautiful space with us and your story. We'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Awesome.